What is up, everybody? This is the Wild Nutrition Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Heskett, and this is episode 37. Today, I interview Devin Gage. He is my former boss, a mentor, and a good friend of mine. Devin owns Gage Strength Training in Westchester, Pennsylvania. I believe they're going on their 10-year anniversary there. I worked there for seven years before starting this journey with Peak Wellness Coaching, starting my own business, and he really pushed me into starting this on my own. He also owns or has started up, I'm actually not 100% sure what the business model is, uh, three Engage locations. So there's one in Collegeville, Pennsylvania, Malvern, Pennsylvania, and one in Wilmington, Delaware. Gage Strength Training is the best in-person gym you can go to if you are over the age of 40. That is who they specialized in, or have specialized in, I should say. Devin is a giant nerd when it comes to human psychology. I am also a nerd, so this is actually a huge compliment coming from me. It is not an insult. Uh, He is a nerd when it comes to psychology because to get people results, we need to understand what drives them, what motivates them, and what happens when we self-sabotage. And we talk about habits and a lot of other things in today's podcast. So without further ado, let's get this interview started. Awesome. What's up, Davin? What's going on, Chris? All right. So um, you obviously own Gage Strength Training. For those of you who are listening who don't know Devin, um, I worked with you for seven years, I believe. I believe it was seven years. Yeah, it sounds about right. Yes. So uh, almost there from the beginning. And now you have Gage Strength Training, but you also have three new locations in Gage, which popped up super quick. Um, so one of the things that sets gauge strength training apart from, uh, the rest of the gyms in the area, um, is that you focus on helping people over the age of 40. Um, can you explain kind of like why you went into like that crowd? Like, why did you focus on that crowd? Cause that's like the opposite of like, I'm going to become a personal trainer. I want to work with like 20 year olds and get them like super strong and in shape and like six packs. Yeah. So, I mean, really that's exactly what I wanted to do when I opened, you know, I wanted to work with athletes and weightlifters. I was like a total meathead back then. And what I realized was anybody that had any sort of background in weightlifting and was somewhat driven, didn't want to spend the money that I needed to make in order to get better. So like a lot of power lifters and strongmen and uh, people that were already in that realm, we're just kind of like doing it in their garage or they could do it anywhere. So I just had this basic little garage space that, uh, you know, essentially nobody wanted to come to. And I just had no idea what I was doing in terms of running an actual business. So it was a couple months in to renting my space here in Westchester that I was still like piecing together, like in-home personal training clients and just trying to like, piece everything together to to get by. And I was kind of faced with like, all right, do I just fold? It was like three to four months in or five or six months in. And I was like, maybe I just, I just fold. And I like the lease payment was so small. It was like a thousand dollars. I was like, I can just pay out the lease for the, the rest of this year and walk away from this and just never tell anybody it happened. Um, or I can go all in. And I worked with a mentor at the time and was like, dude, you have to like give this a real shot. So at the time, Groupon and uh, whatever the other discount thing was called back then, I can't remember what it was, were the really big things. So I ran a Groupon. I got like five people in for this just like insane discount that was like 20 sessions for $50 or something, just absolutely insane. And then like a huge amount of that goes to Groupon. So I just started training these people. Uh, for no money essentially. And that was where there were all adult clients that were just general population. And I found just like, I could just be myself where with athletes and weightlifters, I always felt like I had to like be on and like really, you know, I, I couldn't just hang out and have fun and be expressive. So I've just fell in love with that market. Uh, just from like the, the connection wise, but also the impact that you can have, you know, athletes, 
are great. A lot of people love working with athletes because I think it's a nice ego stroke because you get to ride their natural ability and, and kind of claim it as your own a little bit. But I got so much gratification out of the fact that, you know, I could take a hundred pounds off of a person and add years to their life and life to those years, whether the weight changed at all, you know, you can add life to somebody's years. Um, and I'll never forget. I was probably like a year or two in and I, I was at Hershey park with my daughter. Uh, and just the amount of people that either couldn't go on rides with their kids or, or I'll just never forget. I, I was walking by and a kid really wanted to go on this ride and the, and the mom or maybe a grandma just couldn't do it. And it was like, I want to help this person. And I want to, I never want somebody to take their kid to an amusement park and tell their kid, you cannot ride the teacups because, you know, mom or dad can't go on that ride, you know, and that just became like a really strong calling and passion for me. Um, And I just pivoted every single thing I was doing to that adult fitness market. And I think just my passion for it and uh, just being able to be authentic in myself just really helped, uh, you know, accrue more clients and people felt that passion. And then it just kind of grew from there. Definitely. I mean, athletes are fun, like you said, but when you get somebody in and they tell you like, Hey, like I've, I never had confidence and now I had confidence or I always tell the story. I don't say any names, but we had a period in the gym where, uh, all of a sudden, all these women were getting out of these toxic marriages <laughs> yeah. where they they just got confidence in themselves. Like the first time in their life since probably they were like a teenager or ever, they finally had the confidence and the willpower to be like, OK, no, like I'm going to stand up for myself. And it was it was a weird time, but it was also like, holy shit, like these people are changing their lives. And you don't see that with like the 20 year old population or the athletes you see that with the 40 plus. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of like that intangible, like, you know, so much of the results we give, we get people are internal and you never see it on a scale. You don't see it in a clothing size, but like the way they walk, the way they talk, you know, they finally have confidence in themselves to go out and be happy. And and dude, I, I know you've seen it. Like we have seen some unbelievable astonishing changes in people and a lot of them left. Like a lot of them are not here anymore because they've grown into another person that need what we were doing anymore. But I was just proud to play a part in like helping them unlock what they already had inside them. You know? Yeah. I, we had quite a few people in the gym where all of a sudden like they left the gym because now they wanted to do like a specific sport, like Olympic yeah. weightlifting or strongman or powerlifting. Like, yeah, we can't offer that for you anymore. Like, but it was really cool to see them like grow. Like they started with like, I'm terrified of a gym to now they're competing. Yeah. And that's, you know, when you mentioned like what makes us great for people over 40 or why we approach that niche, what I realized is like, you know, you've probably heard of the term like first or one trial learning where, you know, it's, you know, kind of term in uh, neuroscience where if you do one thing one time, and the reaction is so severe that you never do it again. Like the first time you put your hand on a hot stove when you're a kid, you get burned, right? You never, ha- you don't have to do that again to know that your brain carved a pathway between that stove is hot, don't touch it. So many of our clients that are overweight and over 40 have had that one trial learning experience with gyms where they walked in, immediately didn't fit in. They were embarrassed. Somebody laughed at them. They got hurt. They had this one trial learning experience where just the thought of going to what looks like a gym sends chills down their spine. And we get that all the time. So we make a point to just be as like warm and welcoming, you know, everything that we do when they walk through the door is like, show them that this is safe, show them to overcome that one trial learning because their brain is wired to associate weights and rubber floors and the look of a gym with this is not for me and we have a really powerful position to be able to and it doesn't happen overnight like you can't you you really can't flip that one trial learning very easily but over time you start to it's like 
uh, it's like exposing yourself to your, uh, to your fears, right? They, they call it like a exposure treatment or exposure okay. therapy. Like it's like exposure therapy to the gym. You're just exposing them to this scary environment enough times that they feel a sense of safety and empowerment. And now they feel like they finally can do it. And it just unleashes this whole other person inside of them. 100%. It's, and experiencing it in a way that's actually constructive, it's safe, they're having good time, they're around other people going through the same thing as them versus like, like you said, going to another gym and there's the asshole teenagers in the corner laughing at them or doing whatever. It's now it's a place where they can be comfortable. And when they do that, they become more coachable. And when you become coachable, you get better results. Right. But when someone starts seeing results, then they're like, oh my God, this actually works. I can do this. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Um, so obviously you have the one spot in Westchester. That's like the main hub that's gauge, but tell us a little bit about your newer spots, uh, the engage trainings. What's different about those? Yeah. So gauge, I started 10 years ago. Um, I, I look at gauge as like my, my baby, my, my baby dinosaur. Cause it's kind of like, it's, it's got so much stuff that has just accrued over the years, like thing ways we've done things and schedules and, and stuff that like is impossible to duplicate in any capacity. I don't think there's any one person that could do and again, I'm not saying that as like an arrogant way, but it just, I would never try to do it somewhere else. It would just be way too much work. There's too many moving parts. There's too much going on. Um, so we essentially took what has grown to be our most popular program, our small group personal training. And we just realized like it can be so much simpler and more convenient and more effective for people in these, you know, what we're calling kind of micro gyms. So we took our small group personal training program and we've been able to open these satellite locations where we're really just giving great trainers the opportunity to make a better living than they probably ever could almost in any other training job um, where they get to open a gym that has a proven model with zero upfront cost. We cover all the cost. And they partner with myself and Jeff, who's my partner in this. And <clears throat> we give them all the playbooks, everything that they need to be successful. And these gyms are built to be what we call like small giants, where they they will max out at 120 clients, max. Wow. So all they have to do is we invest everything that we can to get that 100, 120 people. And then we kind of shut the doors and we only take new clients in when other people leave. But the whole goal is to build these small but mighty communities of like-minded fitness people that are in a safe environment that uh, don't have to worry about any of that other stuff with the gyms. They know who they're working out with. They know it's other people just like them. And it's a blend of workouts that are incredibly effective in resistance training and fat loss functional fitness and the community that you don't find in a lot of other gyms that are doing that. What's the difference? So obviously I know the answer, but I've also been out for a little while. So things might have changed a little bit. What's the difference between your small group program and say going to another gym that says they have small group? Yeah. So there's a few, a few differences. So at gauge, uh, and, and what we do is every program is individualized. So, you know, when we have a client come in, um, we do an assessment that's based on, you know, just a real gauge of your fitness level, your uh, cardio, your flexibility, your overall strength, and really an emphasis on your goals and injuries. So, you know, like I'm only 34 and I'm beat <laughs> up. Like uh, people over 40 have shit, yep. right? Uh, they've got back injuries, knee injuries, tons of arthritis. So, we really individualize it to everybody and what they need. Um, so we have up to seven people in a session, but everybody has their own individual folder. So it's not a group class where most small group personal training gyms operate as a, as a group class where it's like, here's the workout guys. We're going to make minor adjustments, but um, you know, the way we do it is harder, but I believe it's just the, the way that we should be doing it. 
Um, and that's, that's a big difference. Now at Engage, we've simplified it a little bit. So it's a little more scalable and simplified. Um, but the model at Gage in Westchester is everybody still got their folders. Um, I don't see us move into any, you know, third party technology in the near future. I like our folders. I think it adds a lot of like individualization when coaches can write notes and members can like, you know, add stickers and, and personal touches to their folder. But, uh, yeah, most gyms just run small group and we run small group personal training. Yeah. Still with the full, I, how many conversations do we have about trying to move to like iPads or other things? It's like, no, the folders are the best way to do it. Yeah. And listen, it's a little outdated. Like we still have to buy paper folders, which is not fun. You know, it's not the most green thing in the world, but the tech stuff, uh, again, we're dealing with a lot of older populations. It's tough to get them to be um, native to some of these newer technologies. And it's just like one little hurdle that we're like, you know what? When you walk in the door, your folder is going to be on your bench. We're going to tell you exactly what to do here. Yeah. Um, and for those listening, and I'm sure it's still the same way, but if you're trying to imagine the way it's set up, it's like everybody kind of has their own station. Like you show up and you're in a group setting of up to seven people, but you kind of go to like, like you said, your folders on a bench. That's kind of like your bench for the session, correct? That's how it's kind of still is. Yeah. And I think that was one of the things after. After COVID, um, we, we made that move because of COVID. We didn't want people like sharing a ton of equipment and, and walking around and, you know, bumping shoulders with other people. So, you know, as much as of, a, of like a personal gym that we can create. So everyone's got their own bench. We bring the equipment to you. <clears throat> and that's that's essentially how we're running uh, that small group program. Awesome. I mean, that was, I remember before COVID, that was a big complaint was like, sometimes those sessions would just get sometimes really crazy. And then we went to COVID. It's like, oh my God, like, why didn't we do this before? Like yeah. everything's more organized. Everybody feels safe, especially someone new coming in. Everyone feels safe. It doesn't seem like total chaos because you're just like in your, your area. And then you only go out for like, maybe like doing say like a sled push or something else, which might sound scary if you're listening, but it, it's super safe to do. Um, but yeah, that, that move was definitely a game changer with coaching. Yeah. And it's, again, especially after COVID, like I, I think one of the keys to our success was we were positioned really well because if you had any sort of worry about COVID, you could go to a gym and work with a trainer and not have to worry about, Oh, this gym has 10,000 members that are coming and going. I don't know these people. Right. We, we can guarantee like capacity would never exceed like 20% of the room's capacity. Everything was like no shared equipment and it was all just like safer and it was cheaper than one-on-one, -on -one, which kind of put ourselves in a really good position with all the other things going on in the world and the economy. Yeah. It was either like, online something outdoor boot camps or one-on-one -on -one training and then there was gauge yeah awesome okay so your other other than running business your other hobby is studying human psychology which you've said i would call it an obsession <laughs> not <Yes>. necessarily it's a... <laughs> um you read a ridiculous amount of books on it <laughs> i'm always amazed at how many books you can get through so um if someone's listening, they're new, they're this 40 or maybe like most of my audience is like 35 plus. So really close to that 40 and up. So what could be some tips or some advice you can give someone to help them overcome a hurdle, whether it's habits or fear of getting into a gym? Man, a lot of, a lot of things come to mind, but uh, the first thing, um, start questioning your thoughts. Uh, I think a lot of people believe whatever comes to mind and that's usually never true so what i would ask you to do is um there's a victor frankel quote and it's like between every stimulus and response is a space and in that space is your ability to make a or to res to really respond Ooh, to that like and that. choose choose your response so you know a lot of people just react to things and reactions are really chaotic they miss their workout. So they are like, ah, I just, I, I, I'm a loser. I can't do it. And then they binge eat or they have one bad meal. And then they're like the, what the heck effect kicks in and they just eat poorly the rest of the day or the week. So 
slow yourself down. And, you know, the concept is something happens, the bigger we can make that space between stimulus and response, the more empowering we can make the outcome, right? So start questioning, you know, once you start to like have those thoughts spiral, just ask yourself, what's a better way to think about this? Or is this true? And the challenge that I put out to people is like, would you place a bet on that outcome or that being true? So if somebody starts spiraling because they missed a workout or they ate a donut for breakfast and they start calling themselves a loser and I'll never do this or whatever, you know, or, or even just the fear of going to a gym. If they start thinking people are going to laugh at me, people are going to judge me, I'm going to get hurt. You know, how much money would you really place it, put on a bet that that really was going to happen? When you start thinking about it that way, like, like if somebody pulls up to the gym and they're like, I'm going to, I'm going to get hurt. This is really going to be horrible for me. Just like a hundred bucks. Would you put a hundred bucks if you walked in that gym and got hurt? Is that really like a bet that you would place? Most people say no, because they know that the majority of our uh, fears and failures happen in our mind versus in reality. So, so start questioning your thoughts when you do start to spiral, take a second, slow yourself down and just say, all right, what is real here? Um, what is real? Is this really actually likely to happen or am I just freaking out right now? And usually your rational mind, given a little bit of time can kick in. Um, so that's, that's a really good one. Uh, I would say in terms of like changing behavior, um, I've come up with this kind of river river model Okay. of behavior change. And so essentially, if you want to change a habit or if you want to break a bad habit and replace with a, with a new good one, um, consider like all the, everything that comes at us in our lives is like a, a rush of flowing water, right? Like a mm-hmm. river, yep. right? We go through our lives and we're absorbing all of this stimulus. All of this stuff is being shoveled into our eyeballs and into our brains and being processed and every every trigger usually has some sort of automatic outcome. So I'll use a really stupid, simple example. So I, when I lived in a house for a long time, I had a key holder right when I walked in the door. So every day I'd walk in the door and put my keys on the hook and I knew where they were, right? Yep. The, the trigger for that behavior, that habit was walk in the door, keys go on the hook. The reward that I was getting for that was psychological safety and ease and simplicity. Right. So that became a habit that I just never thought about. It was completely automatic. When I moved to a new house, I like did that a couple of times where there was no key hook. You know, you walk in and you're just like, oh, boop, and they fall on the floor. That's like a habitual thing that, you know, happens because your brain has associated walking in the door with putting your keys on the hook. That is a habit. So if you have a habit that you want to break, think of it like a river which is all of your stimulus in front of you. And the body of water that it leads to is the outcome, right? Is the reward. All these triggers are leading to a specific outcome that you may want to change. When you sit home at dinner after a long day and you open a bottle of wine, if you do that enough times, that will become a habit and you'll start doing it before you even realize you're doing it because it's so automatic at that point. Let's say you want to lose weight. You want to cut back on drinking. How do you break that habit? Well, think of it like a river. If you wanted to redirect the flow of water, there's two things you have to do. The first one is build a dam, right? You have to stop the flow. So if that glass of wine is the habit that you want to break, you build the dam by moving it out of sight, get it out of the house entirely, or they have this 20 second rule in psychology, which is like any behavior that takes more than 20 seconds to accomplish is like 80% less likely to happen. So can you put the wine bottles in a different area of the house, in the basement, in somewhere really inconvenient? If you're 5'9", like me, maybe in the tallest cabinet where you need a step stool. So that's the dam, right? But that's not forever because that's not realistic. So right. you still have to feed that craving that you have when you're stressed out and you sit down at dinner. So how can you give yourself something that, has a similar reward that you can replace the, that body of water. So how do you get a new outcome? You start digging a trench, right? So if you were going to, again, 
redirect a flow of water. And the reason I like this analogy that I created, I didn't steal it from anybody for once. Um, <laughs> digging a trench is hard. It does not come easily. Like you no. got to go get the shovel. You're going to break a sweat. It is going to take a lot of effort and a lot of work and repetition. All right. So the first like trench you dig is going to be a couple inches deep. It's not enough to naturally redirect the flow of water because okay. that river has been running a long time. That behavior is so ingrained in your brain that it's very deep. So you have to do it over and over and over again with a conscious effort until the new behavior is deeper than the old one. And then you can release the dam. And now you've got a brand new habit that that flow of water is going to naturally go to the new habit. And you just have to make sure the you're getting some sort of reward. So sometimes I'll tell people like there's all kinds of like zero calorie, non-alcoholic things that are like wine. Like you could do some sort of nootropic drink, like a, there are these drinks called recess or hop waters. Mm -hmm. um, lots of like replacements that are zero calories, zero alcohol that are good replacements. And they give you like a tiny bit of feel good, you know, adaptogens and nootropics. So understanding. So if you want to break bad habits, understanding like what's the cue, what's the trigger, right? If it is wine, it's I'm sitting down after a stressful day. I had a craving for wine. What does wine give you? It gives you relaxation. It you know kind of shuts your brain down. So how do you get relaxation, shut your brain down without drinking wine? And then you replace that response. Awesome. I, I really like that. I, what is it? Is it Michael Hyatt goes over like the habit loop and that's yeah, been something yeah. I teach clients, which it's very similar, but I actually like that analogy way better because it, it's a better visual in my mind of like how to actually like stop a bad habit and then create that new one. And it, it really is like, it's really hard. Like yes. it takes a very conscious effort where it takes intention. It takes repetition. The first like couple weeks is going to be very intentional about it. Eventually it'll flow more naturally, but you have to, you do have to commit to it. And that's why habits are hard to break. Yes. So on the same topic of habits, something that is brought up every single week with my clients um, or in my Facebook community is stress management. So a lot of people, it's either thought of this because of alcohol. It's either go to alcohol or I'll talk to someone about stress management and their exact words are just survive. So not great stress management skills to have. What would you recommend for someone since stress management is kind of like a habit what are some things you can do to help manage stress? Because most people are just way too stressed out. That's a good question. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big believer in meditation. Uh, I've been meditating pretty much every single day for, I want to say like a couple of years, three or four or five years now. Um, it's not for everybody, but everybody should do it. Uh, and I think the big thing with meditation is it only takes about 10 minutes a day. I use an app called Headspace. It's actually like a, a beginner's app, but I'm using it for so long because I'm just so like, it's really simple. I just do it for 10 minutes and I'm, and I'm good. And they say 10 minutes is all it takes to like actually physically rewire your brain and start to see physical changes in the gray matter of your brain. Oh, wow. And essentially what you're doing is you're just training yourself to not react to thoughts. So meditation is not trying to keep your mind blank. It is simply letting things go without reacting. And I think a lot of stress is reactionary. Mm -hmm. So you're just get, you're flexing the muscles of your brain to like, slow down a little bit um, and just give yourself a little bit of time. I think as much unplugged time in general as you can get is great. So I think meditation. Um, and then the next one I'll say is walking. So walking, a lot of people, you know, when they join the gym, they're like, Oh, I walk all the time and I walk for exercise. I, I really, you know, this is maybe this is a controversial opinion, but walking is not a workout. Walking is, is exercise it's movement but it's not a workout you're not putting enough demand on your body to cause a significant change 
unless you are like incredibly deconditioned. Yes. What walking is, is a central nervous system regulator where it's hard to be, you know, unless you're walking with your phone in front of you, it forces you to breathe rhythmically. It forces you to be somewhat unplugged and you're out in nature, which as you know, there's all kinds of like nature effects on the body yep. and the brain, but just walk every day. Um, try to get those five to 10,000 steps. Um, and I think that makes a really, really big difference. And it really acts more as a recovery tool and a stress management tool than it does exercise. 100%. I try to walk every day after lunch and kind of, for me, same thing, unplugged and it helps reset my brain. So then I can focus on like the second half of my work day of eat lunch. One of the dog has to go out. So go walk the dog, but try not to be on my phone at all. Do that. Come back. And you definitely focus and you called me out on this, but it's, um, by going into that, you kind of go into default mode network. That's how you say it, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you called me out on the podcast. I was default network mode. Um, so that's where kind of like your brain is subconsciously, and I'm probably going to oversimplify, but subconsciously figuring things out. It's kind of like why you have your best thoughts in the shower or on the toilet when you don't have your phone. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, so essentially the default mode network is like the, where your brain always tends to go. So you could, it, you know, they call it something in NLP, they call it like the demon, right? Cause okay. a lot of times it's that reactionary thing that we've trained our brains to do uh, in a bad way. So you want to learn how to like tame the demon by doing things like unplugging and going for walks and really just slowing your, slowing yourself down. Um, our brains just have not evolved as quickly as like, the outside world. So the outside world just completely hijacks our, you know, thought cycles and our, our thought loops. So we don't even give our chance ourselves a chance. Like the second we get stressed, we just stuck our face in a phone and find something about it versus yep. being forced to like, Oh yeah, maybe this is another way to think about it. You know? Yeah. Um, I, I try to use it for figuring out, one problems I'm stuck on. So like, if I'm stuck on a problem, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go for a walk. Like, I can't yeah. figure this out. I go for a walk and I probably figure it out. Now, anyone listening. So the goal isn't like to go and you're like Pooh Bear where he's like sitting on stump, like think, think, think. It's like, don't think about it at all. And probably at some point you'll figure it out. If it's a really complex problem, like I'll go for a hike. It's like 90 minutes later, oh shit, I figured it out. That's why. And usually it's something stupid. It's never something super complex. Um, yeah, I, I do a lot of my thinking while I drive out to Reading where my daughter's mom lives, you know, multiple times a week. I, I do a lot of driving. I always find I have some of like my best ideas when I'm driving. And then I, yep. I bother everyone that works for me with like unloading all my ideas on them. Oh, I remember those. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think of this? Why are you messaging me at this time on a Saturday? Oh, you're driving. That's why. Um, crap. I forgot what I was going to say. Um, yeah, I, to I totally just, I had another idea of going in the same, same direction and just, oh, I know. Um, the other thing I find is helpful for people is like power listing. Like a lot of people just try to keep everything like up in their head. Mm -hmm. I know I was super guilty of this for a long time. And that's another stress way to like manage your stress is like getting it out of your head onto paper or even onto your phone. But I find papers better where it's like your top, like three to five things you need to do for the day and all your tasks you have to get done. Like if you can get those out of your head the night before you don't get those ruminating thoughts of like, Oh, tomorrow I have to do X, Y, and Z. And then the next day you can kind of just like go through and check off everything. Like it's a super busy day, but I'm not stressed about it because I have everything out instead of trying to remember everything in our heads. Cause our memory is pretty terrible. Yeah. Our brains are, are not meant for storage. It's meant for creative creativity and creation. So the more we let shit just pile up in our brains, the more just uh, overwhelmed we're going to start feeling. So I actually created a journal. I don't know if I ever, 
did I ever send you one of my full engagement planners? No. So I've, I've been using planners for the last couple of years, Michael Hyatt's planners, uh, one that I've used for a long time. There was just a few things that I would be doing outside of it. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to publish my, my very own planner. Oh, nice. So I'll, I'll have to send you one, but, uh, it's essentially every week at the beginning of the week. The first thing it does is gives you a couple pages to do a brain dump where it instructs you to like put 20 minutes on a clock and just dump everything out of your brain, no matter what. And they call it like the hot pen where don't stop the pen moving. Even if it's something stupid, irrelevant, you know, not important, just get it out of your head and on paper. And the next page, it, challenges you to sort it to uh this is a to-do list item this is something that i delegate so i need to off source outsource to somebody else i need to ask somebody else for help or it's a delete which is again just a dumb thought and i start crossing stuff off and uh the other one is delay so stuff that's just not important right now yep and then so that's how you start your week and then every day there's three spots for to-dos no more three right okay there are only three things when people start going into every single day with a really long to-do list, it just becomes overwhelming. There's too many things to like, you're making too many decisions and it, it, you know, makes you less likely to get things done. So what you do is go back to your do from the weekly dump, pull three. Once you get those done, by all means, go get three more or one more, whatever you have the time for. But if you go in, in with a 20 per thing list, you're going to get less done because you're not going to be hyper-focused. Um, so go do the three. If you finish, you, you're pretty much done, but you can do more. And then uh, just keep repeating that every day. And then you've got your week dump that you're constantly pulling from. Once you do that, if you feel out of control, just uh, do another brain dump, you know, do it whatever way you, you know, as much as you need to. Um and that's like, that's one of the really ways that I've been able to keep my, my brain organized is like, just have three to do's no more every single day. And that's it. Okay. I always do five, but yeah, it's usually like there's the third, like one or one to three are like high priority. And then it's like two are lower on the totem pole. And then there's like all the other like random shit you have to do in a day, um, yeah, and like I think, check email listen, and stuff. And you also have to, like, I have a very ADHD brain. You have a, like, more of like a type two brain where you think, I think you can, you can stay on task and be a little bit more <clears throat> functional and organized than myself. So three is like my max. Okay. Um, now other stuff pops up and I'm writing notes and I'm, I'm doing other stuff, but all I need to do is get those three things done every day. And I know everything else, if I don't get it done, it's not as important as those, those three things. Yeah. I always phrase it like, if you can get your list done, it was a good productive day. Like you can put like a star on that day. Like, okay, I did it. There's yeah. always more stuff to do. You can always find more to do, but you can be like, Hey, today was actually a good day. I checked off everything I need to do. And I can go into tomorrow's feeling like I accomplished something. Even if it's one, like every Monday for me always feels like it's one of those days where it's so busy yet you accomplish nothing. Just the yeah. tiny, all the tiny tasks. It's like the task score switching just drains my brain so much of like this thing. And then I have to message this and then I have to check my emails and we have to do our team meeting and all these things add up. So it's like that day, it's super important that, okay, everything's checked off. Even though I felt like I accomplished zero, I actually had a great day. Like, okay, I can go into Tuesday and then focus on these other things that didn't get done or that popped up. Um, now the, something that I get asked a lot is how do you balance those things with your personal and work life? Because some, a lot of people will start with their work life and it'll organize it, but then they don't use it in their personal life. And then their personal life gets like chaotic with kids sports and trying to get their workouts in and meal prep and all the other things that go with the personal life. So is there a tip you can use? Like, do you do two separate things for your work and personal, or is it all intermingled into one? So a lot of it's intermingled. Uh, there's three things that just come to mind. So <clears throat> first one is I love the exercise of creating your ideal week. So again, it's in the planner. It's another thing in the planner that I, that I 
love doing. And it's, it's just a, a week long template Monday through Sunday. And you fill in, you, you think about if I had the perfect week, what would I do? I would probably work out three days a week. I would spend X amount of time with my kids and my family. Um, I would uh, get X amount of work done. I would do X amount for engage and X amount for GST. And then you work backwards from there, starting with the things that you always overlook. So for me personally, it's not easy to balance, you know, the five businesses plus family life. So I always try to put the family time in there first. So every Tuesday afternoon, I'm with my daughter Cadence um, and I shut my work down essentially at 6 p.m. Uh, I come home at like 5.30, shut things down from 5.30, 6 to 7 when the baby goes to sleep. Then I have my nights where I do other work or I read or whatever, but I put all the family stuff in there first because it's all the stuff that I usually would, you know, fortunately brush like yeah. I would just be doing work. Uh, my workouts are next because that's the other thing that, again, I would just be like, there's always something more important to do than get my workout in. Um, and then I do all the rest, right? So you're kind of prioritizing. They're written in marker on your thing and you do that. <clears throat> um, th so that's a really great exercise. The full engagement planner.com. You can buy a planner and all that stuff is in there with instructional videos on how, how to do that too. That's awesome. Um the next thing is being more intentional with your like family time. So mm -hmm. not only, uh, you know, trying to be as distraction free as possible, but try to like come up with some really intentional questions or dialogue that you can have. So instead of just the bullshit, like, Hey, how was your day, honey? Or whatever, like find some questions that you can ask. They're a little bit more poignant. You can encourage discussion and, you know, whatever you guys can relate on, try to be more uh, intuitive or more intentional about that. And the last thing, and I actually don't think it, I have it on me, but so what I, what I started and actually I broke my streak this weekend because I was really, really sick with strap all weekend. Oh. But at, every Sunday I bought a flip phone and I'm doing flip phone Sundays where for the rest of my life from nine to 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Sunday, I will only be able to be reached on my flip phone. I'll, uh, so what I did was the, <clears throat> the driving uh, focus feature on my iPhone mm -hmm. has an auto reply that says, hey, I'm spending time with family. Uh, you can re and in case of an emergency, you can reach me at this number. So it helps this anxiety of like, what if there is an emergency and somebody needs me? Because yep. now they can reach me. But it's actually been, I've had some of the best days with my kids that I've had in a long time because of forcing myself to use the flip phone and there's just nothing on it. Like I can't even play snake on this thing. There's <laughs> nothing on this thing. So that's been, and I just bought like a prepaid wireless plan, 20 buck phone. And so that's, you know, something that's very intentional that I've, that I've added over the last couple, I guess, month. That's awesome. I tried to, it, it's tough because you get literally addicted to your phone. Um, but mm -hmm. I tried to like leave it, like I'll like leave my phone down here in the basement and then I'd go upstairs. It's like, good luck. You can't get a hold of me because I don't have my phone on me. Um, or like we'll go outside and I'll try to leave my phone inside. But it's tough. Um, it's for, addicting. It's, it's a full blown, very, very legitimate psychological addiction. Yes. And I found, the power in it was because I've tried this before with the flip phone and it didn't work because I never had the auto reply that said, you can reach me at this phone. So nobody had the phone number. So it didn't do anything to cause the, the, the stress of what if there is an emergency? So I always found myself like going back and getting sucked back into the iPhone just to see if there's an emergency. And guess what? And the like five Sundays that I've done this so far, nobody has needed to call me or text me. So it's really just all in our head. Um, but yeah, having that auto reply has been a game changer because I, I remind myself if it is important, they'll just call me. Yep. Well, that's uh, I saw I texted you on Sunday and I got the auto reply back. I was like, that's actually really cool. I might yeah. have to do this idea. <laughs> Cause so I try to completely log off on Sundays too. Like I try 
um, limited posting, just like try to be off social media, but it, it's tough. The only thing I do on Sunday is same thing. Uh, I'm sure you still do it, Gage, is like the Sunday staff check-in. Yep. That's the only thing I do on Sundays, but I usually do that Sunday night. Um, so it's like the one, like kind of getting my brain ready for work. Like, okay, I'm going to like write down what I need to do for Monday. So I do that, but that's usually like, at like six or 7 PM. Um, but yeah, that's been very helpful for me of like getting off your phone. Cause I'll be doing work. Like I'm like doing like an hour of work, writing emails or designing something for clients. And it's amazing how many notifications you get on your phone. Just like it knows you haven't picked yeah. it up for a while. Like in an hour, you're like, what the hell? Well, and here's actually, here's something that I've learned and it's actually devious what they do is if you pick your phone up after 10, 15 minutes, you might have like 15 notifications and they're all like dumb stuff. Like always dumb. It's they're like really small and like this person liked your photo, this one, this one, this one. If you pick it up after a full day, probably will only have like 10 notifications because they start lumping them all together. Oh. They start saying 20 people liked this photo. So they know that every time you pick up your phone, if you've got a lot of notifications, it just feeds that addiction of I'm so important. I can't put this thing down. But they also know that if you pick it up after a full day and there's so much, it's going to be overwhelming. So it actually like I found after a long day, I'm like, oh, wow the world doesn't need me and it's not that important to have me on my phone all day, but they, they do. I think it's an intentional thing to get you to stay in there. I wouldn't be surprised, surprised with how many things they do. I mean, I put time limits on all my social media apps of like, Hey, it pops up like you've passed your yeah. time limit. Oh, okay. I've just been like dicking around on TikTok for way too long. I've done nothing productive <laughs> here. I've just been watching videos like, okay, it's time to get off. And I've like, over time, I've made that time limit shorter and shorter because, like, I'm so I want to use these apps constructively and to like actually post content. I don't want to be consuming them too much. So it's like the short, less amount of time I can spend on there, the better. And for myself personally, I have a challenge. Like every week, you get I'm sure you get the um like the time you spend on your phone, like the average amount. Yep. I try to make a game of every week. I want to see that decreasing. Yeah, that's that's something that I haven't been uh, tracking. Is I, I always think I'm like I gotta set like some goals for this, and I just I, I haven't stuck to it. But uh, I, another thing that's helpful is I delete Facebook and Instagram completely off my phone every day. So when I pull up to the gym, it's part of my like work startup ritual. Is I park the car, I delete Facebook, I delete Instagram. And that's really all I have, and then I go into work. And then if I do need it, I can re-download it and do it. And then I get rid of it again. But that has been huge. Just that little bit of obstacle of having to re-download it is enough to keep me off and distracted. Nice. I put mine. So I don't do that because um, I have to like do stories multiple times a day and shit. But right. um, I put mine all the way in a folder in like the mm -hmm. furthest reaches of my phone. So for me to go, I have to like swipe like five times click on something, then click the app. And then I try to always like exit out the app afterwards. So that's helped me of like, instead of being on that front page where most people have their social media, mine's in like the very, like the furthest back region of my phone of, I have to be very intentional. Like I need to go post something or I need to post a story, swipe 37 times, click the thing, click again. And it's just adding those steps. Kind of like what we talked about earlier with like um, the 20 second rule. Yeah. Another little pro tip is there's actually a setting and I set this up so long ago, I can't remember how to do it, but you can on this, if, if you have an iPhone, at least if you click your side button three times, it turns your whole phone grayscale. So really, another, and you have to, you have to turn on the setting. So you have okay. to like something in like the accessibility, but uh, really, so these app companies, they know that you get what's called banner blindness. So if you've got the same series of apps for a long enough time, they stop attracting your attention. So what they do is they constantly, like every time they update, they'll tweak the coloring, they'll make them brighter or like they'll change the coloring. So it pops a little bit more and recaptures your attention. So if you really do want to like, you know, set yourself up for success, you can turn your phone to grayscale and then it just completely bypasses 
you know, how these tech people are trying to zap your brain from your face. Probably saves your battery life too. Awesome. So we are running out of time. Um, so let's finish up. Um, what is one, one other tip you would give someone over 40, they're just starting their weight loss journey. They've committed to themselves that they want to make a change in their life. Where would you suggest they start? Uh, I mean, obviously gauge strength training or engage personal training, but really just show up, like show up anywhere, uh, and just keep showing up. Uh, you know, most gyms are perfectly safe places to go and it has much more to do with the stories we make up in our, in our heads and the unlikely stories that we make up about what's going to happen. Um, it, there is no perfect workout. There is no workout that is the one size fits all, you know, even ours, you know, we, we focus on people over 40 and really what that means is we don't do any running, jumping or burpees. Everything's low impact. It's easy on our joints. Cause we know your joints are feeling pe- beat up for the most part. Um, but really just try something and don't give up. Um, most people try something once and they're like looking for any reason not to continue just don't give up. If it's important enough, just change the plan, change the approach, try something new and, and keep trying. Awesome. Thank you for coming on. And where can people go to follow you or any of the, uh, the gauge or engage facilities? So I'd say uh, the most action is on our gauge strength training, Instagram. Uh, so go to gauge strength training on Instagram or Facebook, my personal stuff. I don't, I don't do a ton of personal stuff um i'm planning on putting out some more like personal content but uh yeah gauge strength training g-a-g-e uh and then facebook and instagram awesome thank you and um if you guys liked hearing this make sure to leave a review down below and then go follow Devin at, at gauge strength training those uh links will be down in the show notes Hey guys, thanks for tuning in today's episode. Make sure to check out the show notes. Go give Devin and Gage Strength Training a follow. Also, just like I just said, try not to say just anymore, but please leave a five-star review and actually write out a review. This helps other people find the podcast and I read it to help get new guests on and figure out what you guys because like because ultimately I am doing this for you the the listener not viewer the listener also this friday for unapologetic friday make sure to stay tuned because we have a special announcement for podcast listeners coming out for first dibs before we launch we have something new launching so it's going to be big huge massive it's going to be awesome we're going to try not to sound like trump too much more so it's going to be awesome Stay tuned Friday that's coming out. So listen to that episode at the end of Friday's episode. There's going to be a special announcement.